Well, welcome to the uh, July 6, 2023 program of the Tucson Cactus and Silicon Society. Uh, Mish Pillay is a, uh, a uh, doctorate uh, candidate at the U of A in ecology and evolutionary uh, biology. He is also a program officer for the International Union for Conservation of Nature and for, and in this case, for Species Survival uh, Commission on Cactus and Succulent Plants. His subject tonight is, is most important to the future of cact Cactaceae, especially in the light, uh, as you've seen, that the Earth has experienced the three hottest days in the last 125,000 uh, years. Uh, and I can verify that. I was there. Um, his, uh, his program tonight is entitled Common Sense Cactus Conservation in the 21st uh, century. So please welcome Mish Pillay. Mish? Um, thanks very much for having me. I live in Tucson, and even though I do give uh, talks in other places, it's always really nice to uh, do it here at the home base. And uh, the Tucson Cactus Club is really a model society for cactus and succulent clubs everywhere. So, so the last time I spoke was about last year sometime about the impacts of climate change on cacti. And so that was really highlighting the problem that we're facing, how poorly cacti and also other succulents are doing in the wild. And that's all good, but we need a solution, right? We need to do something about it. And so that's what this talk is about really today. So we're initially going to go over some of the biggest threats to cacti. I'm going to keep that relatively short. And then we're going to be talking about how conservation is done and how conservation has to change if we want to be successful at keeping these plants that we all love um, alive. And when you ask a random person on the street where a cactus likes to live, then that's probably what they would say um, in terms of like the expectations, higher temperatures, lower rainfall. And all of these colored blocks, these colored shapes on this graph are different uh, biomes that we artificially classify. So we've got tundra, we've got tropical rainforests, and so on. And there's only one shape where cacti are missing. And that's all the way at the bottom in very dry deserts, um, well, low temperature deserts, so specifically the tundra. Low precipitation, but also really low, low rainfall. That's the only biome on Earth that we have not found cacti in. So you'll even see cacti all the way uh, at the top right there with really, really high levels of rainfall and high temperatures. So there are cacti in tropical rainforests. If you go down to the Florida Keys on vacation, there's even some columnar cacti there hidden away. So a very wide variety of growth forms. And so that wide variety of growth forms explains partially why cacti are found in all of these environments. So we've got little globular cacti like this uh, Mammillaria herore, Astrophytum asterius from Texas. We've got hedgehog cacti such as the kind of Ceres We've got prickly pears in the Galapagos like this Opuntia echios. We've got little shrubby cacti like Borza cactus semipatanus. Uh, columnar cacti like Micranthus ceres alvinii from Brazil. Ceres childsii, and we have no idea where that plant comes from in the wild, which also is actually the case for aloe vera. So you all know aloe vera. We suspect it originally came from India somewhere, if I remember correctly, but it's never been found. Same thing is true for peanut cactus, by the way. Very common cactus. Peanut cactus, no idea. Then this is Xiabentia verticalata, another Brazilian species, I believe, um, which still retains true leaves. Very nasty spines on that one. So cacti are some of the most threatened organisms on the face of the planet. They're more threatened than mammals and birds. And that's saying something. 31% of species are considered threatened by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So when you, if you've heard the words red list, or if you've heard people describing a species as uh, vulnerable or endangered or critically endangered, 
it's the IUCN, uh, the red list specifically, that does that classification. So they've got different groups or different uh, types of organisms, and I work for the cactus and succulent group. Top of that, a large fraction of species are also located outside of protected areas. So there's no protections in place for the majority of cacti. So these are the different threats according to the IUCN back in 2015. At the very top, on the left-hand side, you've got agriculture and aquaculture. Surprisingly, there's a species threatened by shrimp farming in Baja. Then you've got biological resource use, which also includes poaching. We'll be talking about that quite a bit today. Then you've got development, invasive species, and so on. Habitat destruction is the main one, though. But Last year, um, me and my collaborators published a paper that showed that the most important threat is probably going to be climate change, which I've talked here uh, about before. 60% of species of cacti are estimated to be negatively affected by climate change. But back in 2015, when we knew very little about climate change impacts, it was ranked all the way at the bottom. So now, if we go with the estimate of 60%, it should be all the way over there. So when species are exposed to climate change, there's a few options. One would be to adapt. Evolutionary changes, those are typically slow. They, uh, they take place across many generations. Another one is going extinct. You can't adapt quickly enough and you can go extinct. Or you can try to move across the landscape, so migrate, to keep up with favorable conditions. That's another option. And so that's what my research is about for the most part, where I built these very simple models, statistical models, that take information on where species are, so all those black dots from that graph earlier. Um, and then I combine those occurrences, as we call them, with the climate and geology um, of those regions. So you can see some points there, the black lines. Those are located on a specific spot in the landscape associated with uh, specific climate conditions. Build a statistical model. And then, along with climate change projections for the future, we can predict where those species might want to go in the future. And then we can see well, are they going to be shrinking in their distribution or are they going to be expanding? So it's really simple what I do. Our results were that 60% of species, like I said, are projected to lose part of their range under climate change. And almost a quarter of species lose over 25% of their range. Most of the Sonoran Desert species are also in trouble, according to our projections. Looking at that um, across the Americas, we've got the same story on the left and the right hand side. So all of the areas that are blue or light blue are areas where we expect to see an increase in the number of cactus species. Everything that's yellow, orange, or brown are areas where we expect to see a decrease. And this is by the year 2050 or 2070 rather, although the projections for 2050 are about the same. And so on that short of a time span, species like Saguaro, for example, that take thousands upon thousands of years to even catch up with the changes that happened in the most recent ice age, there's pretty much no hope for a lot of these species on the landscape. They can't move that quickly. And so the large majority of hotspots for cactus diversity, like the American Southwest uh, in some areas, but particularly central Mexico and big chunks of Brazil, are expected to um, experience extreme declines in cactus riches. And to make that problem even worse, those are also the areas that correlate strongly with human impacts. So it's also the areas that human beings like for agriculture, for development, and so on. So like I said, climate change, according to uh, this research project belongs all the way at the top there, unfortunately. So those models I built are easily scalable. Like 
They're very quick to do. They don't cost a lot of money. They just need someone like me sitting in front of the computer with uh, maybe a TV show op open on the other screen while I'm doing uh, some science. Um, I'm just joking. So they're easy to build, but we still need those data of where species occur in the wild. And so the database I currently use is called BN. It's run by the University of Arizona. But the problem is, is that over a third of plant species are rare. And it's also the rare ones that are disproportionately affected by climate change. And for those rare species, typically we don't have enough data on where they occur to build these models. Or they occur in such a small area that we simply can't build those models. So now I'll briefly go over some preliminary results of uh, my next stage of my research project here. Assessing rare species should be a top priority because rare species tend to be more vulnerable. How can we assess them though? My question was, can we leverage those models I built for common species to say something about how rare species may respond to climate change? Well, maybe, but only if closely related species respond similarly to climate change. So think about two species of mammalaria or two species of prickly pear. Do they respond in the same way to climate change? So don't get overwhelmed. This is an evolutionary tree for the mammaloid clade, which includes things like mammalaria and cochumia, some Escobaria, Coryphantas, and so on. Uh, from Baja, this study was conducted by Peter Breslin, one of the authors of the field guide. And he was kind enough to share this evolutionary tree with, uh, with me. So I cleaned it up a little bit for species that I have enough data for, but we started out with 89 species. And so species that are close together on an evolutionary tree are more, more closely related. That's how you can uh, pretty much interpret them. So let's look at that specific group specifically. Let me go over some of the species that are, um, are part of that group. First is Philosophora tuberculosa. There I photographed it near Shafter, Texas. And according to my models, that one will do fine under climate change. It'll actually increase, increase in distribution by 15%. Also classified as least concern. It's not a threatened species. We also have Philosophora alversonii here from a photograph near Blythe, California. Another one that's virtually unaffected by climate change. But then we have species like Pelesophora, or formerly Escobaria, Robinsorum, which occurs in southeastern Arizona. Your photograph near Douglas. You can see it. Can you see it? Who can see it? That picture. Okay, we gotta sit up close though. Right here is one. So it's a miniature species. Um, it's very limited in its distribution, and I can't build a model for it. So I don't know how it's going to respond to climate change. But it's already classified as vulnerable, according to the IUCN Red List. So now with the cleaned up evolutionary tree, what I did is I added all my model results to that tree, and all the green bars correspond to species that do, will do well under climate change. All the red bars are species that won't do well under climate change. So what we're looking for is a pattern. Do closely related species respond similarly? And you'll have to take my worth for it um, from a statistics uh, point of view, but we do not see a pattern. So what, what does that mean? It means that species tend to respond in very individual, unique ways to climate change. Problematic. So that's the situation when it comes to cacti in the wild. Lots of problems, not a lot of solutions. So how do we approach conservation nowadays? This is what's called the one plan approach. And the one plan approach integrates or attempts to integrate two distinct aspects of conservation that are typically done in isolation. When you hear the word conservation, probably your mind will go to protecting natural habitat. It'll go to releasing turtles 
nothing against turtles, love them. Uh, everything out in the wild. That's called in situ conservation. Right there. Now, what I do uh, for the most part is ex situ conservation. And so ex situ conservation is what zoos do and often botanical gardens as well. So they have captive breeding programs. And as sometimes uh, offspring from those captive breeding programs are released into the wild. That's ex situ. But in situ and ex situ conservation are very, very often done in isolation. The two groups don't even talk to each other. And with this one plan approach, we try to merge those two components and integrate them in such a way that we all work towards our common goal, which is a viable in situ population. So a viable population out in the wild. Often wise ex situ conservation is also deemed less important than in situ conservation. Unfortunately, to highlight that here, these are just guidelines. You don't have to read all of this. These are some guidelines to decide whether or not a captive breeding program is even necessary. So for most species, the program is not necessary. When you see zoos uh, or when you see like a very common species at every zoo, then that species is typically not there because it's in trouble in the wild. It's simply there because it draws attention to the zoo. Same thing would be true for saguaro at botanical gardens. Saguaros are in trouble somewhat, depending on who you talk to. They very likely, the situation will very likely get much worse very quickly in the future. But as of right now, most populations are still pretty sizable. So we have saguaros at botanical gardens, but typically that's uh, to celebrate cultural heritage and for beautiful landscape, right? There's no actual breeding program going on. So in situ conservation takes a lot of time and a lot of money. And every in situ program needs to be tailored to the specific needs of that species. You can't preserve a swarrow or you can't conserve swarrow the same way that you would conserve prickly pears or orchids. There's also a relatively high chance of failure. So let's look at Pima pineapple cactus over here, photographed near Green Valley. Um, so looking at transplanted plants specifically, it was found in a master's or PhD thesis in 2017 that for plants that were planted back out into the wild after relocating them, there was about 30% mortality. Whereas the plants that were not reintroduced into nature, mortality was around 2%. So let's once again look at all the big problems facing that our cacti are faced with. Agriculture, development, energy production, road building, all of those issues require local to national intervention. Right? It's not an international problem, typically. The solutions have to come at the local level. So this is uh, Aruba. And See in the background there, according to my, my friend who lives over there, there's a water park. And that water park goes straight through very rare Pilosoceras and Melocactus habitat. That's what that area used to look like, an example of development, right? As you know, like I just said, requires a lot of time and a lot of money to do in situ um, conservation. One of the most successful programs that I know of is the TCSS rescue program, period. I cannot think of a single other succulent organization in the world that does more actual work, not just words, than TCSS. Let's look at biological resource use. So that could be native peoples uh, harvesting um, certain fruits, like swaro, for example. But more importantly, it also includes things like poaching. 
This is a confiscated shipment of Ariocarpus called Chubianus from uh, San Luis Potosí. Um, that was intercepted coming into the U.S. About 500 plants all dug up from the wild and very little chance. Well, we don't really know exactly where they came from, so we can't go plant them back into the ground. So very costly problem, but they'll probably all go back to San Luis Potosí eventually. The problem of poaching in the succulent world is absolutely crazy. It's getting even more out of hand every day. Pretty much every show that I've gone to, every cactus and succulent show that I've gone to in my entire life has had at least one questionable plant that might have come out of the wild. Now, that doesn't mean that that plant was obtained illegally. It could simply be someone buying a collection from someone else, an older collector from before CITES, or in very rare ca cases, it could just look like a plant in the wild. But the problem is absolutely awful. <clears throat> okay. So what makes the difference between successful and unsuccessful conservation? One is informed, empowered governance and leadership. Processes that ensure accountability. And then also making decisions while your options are still there. And that's often when we're looking at conservation actions by governments and international organizations. That's often where the problem lies. Decisions aren't made quickly enough. There's meant too many cooks in the kitchen and we don't actually take any actions before it's too late. And so this article um, is an example about two bird species from, um, uh, uh, yeah, well, one bird species and one mammal species from Australia. One of them went extinct because they couldn't come up with a appropriate conservation plan in time. They just didn't make a decision. And the other one, parrot, parrot's doing fine right now because people actually made the decision even though it wasn't imp it wasn't perfect there's always more information that we'd like to have but that's just not the reality but once again many species need conservation intervention and funding is insufficient when we look at climate change too what is the solution to climate change well it would require international cooperation very quickly. And at this point, it is my personal opinion that it's already too late. Some of these species will go extinct in the wild during our lifetimes. So where do some of these information gaps lie? Those gaps that keep us from making conservation decisions. One is very limited information on where species occur. For cacti, Thanks to botanists and enthusiasts, we have a lot of information about where the species occur in the wild. That's not true for other succulent families, except for maybe agaves. Um, for most Asclepiids or Sepeliids, there's very few observations of where they come from. And one thing you can do as an individual is use an app like iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is an app you can download onto your phone, and when you're out on a hike or something like that, and you see a cool plant, you can add the observation onto iNaturalist. And then iNaturalist allows researchers under specific circumstances to use those data for scientific purposes. So fortunately, iNaturalist isn't that great about sharing data with researchers in a lot of cases. Um, otherwise, I would have distribution models for the majority of cacti at this point. Um, but it is, it is a good idea to do if you're out in the wild. And also data that on the threats that species face in the wild. This is Estevesia Alex Brage from uh, Brazil. Um, at one point, it was considered extinct, and it was just rediscovered a little while ago. And so that's something that the IUCN Red List does, right? It does the conservation assessments. How is this species doing in the wild? For cacti, that information is almost complete. For other succulent families, not the case. And so even if you're a researcher 
and people tend to take you fairly seriously, a lot of the time you don't have access to data. So people are really worried about poaching for good reason. This here is Pierre Brownia browniorum and another Brazilian species, big conservation problems in Brazil. And for Pierre Brownia browniorum, it's not doing well in the wild. And people aren't sharing the locality information. Even with the IUCN, the map that we have is several hundred miles off. Not great. And so based on that map, which was provided to us uh, by the describer, based on that map, we assessed it and was like, well, it's in a partially in a protected area. So it might be okay. But then a little while ago, someone found that location, the actual location. And so I checked with them, well, where is it at approximately? And so I gave them the map that we have because clearly this individual has seen them in the wild. And they looked at it, I was like, oh no, that's several hundred miles off. And then I got this quote, the issue of hiding location is something that needs to be evaluated again. I understand that hiding helps prevent theft, but there's another side. Without knowing where the plants are, nobody can make protection plants. I found the site of Pierre Brownia browniorum, and it's ultra threatened by mining and wind farms. It could destroy everything, as it was not known where the rare plant was in that region of the enterprise. Problem. Uh, like I've mentioned, climate change requires international intervention, and unless we figure out a way to install giant air conditioning systems everywhere in the, um, out in the wild, it's not a good solution. Especially if you get comments like this when I uh, did an interview on uh, my climate change work. So uh, probably time to uh, all do our best, try to change public opinions, try to inform people, educating. But it's not just the general public that doesn't always appreciate the impacts of climate change. Even botanists and biologists in general are really difficult to work with sometimes. For the past year, I've been uh, part of the Copiapoa 2023 uh, plan, um, where it's a bunch of stakeholders from all levels of society. Uh, so government officials, uh, nursery folks, researchers, uh, the IUCN and so on, all have been part of these meetings to see what can be done about Copiapoa, which is a genus of um, mostly Chilean cactus that's extremely intensely poached. Probably out of all cacti, I would say at the moment, the poaching problem is the most intense for Copiapoa. And I have seen many, and if you see a large Copiapoa at a show, you should probably ask questions where that plant came from. In my opinion, the show, like the showing of large Copiapoa, and I'm talking about large ones where it's impossible to ascertain where it came from in the wild or where it came from originally, legally or illegally. I am of the opinion those large plants should not be shown at cactus shows. Small plants, okay, but large plants, you run the risk that those plants are either collected from habitat and you're encouraging people to be fascinated by the large specimens, so creating a market for it. But even as part of this workshop, I did all these models for Copiapo and how they might respond to climate change. And even, even biologists were like, oh, I don't know, like what do these models even do, et cetera, et cetera. Now, finally, they did accept it, which was absolutely fantastic. We, we talked through it, it was a good communication, um, and it's now included in the plan as one of the top threats to Copiapo. And local biologists that do a lot of field work are already seeing the impacts on the local populations of Copiapo in Chile. They're just dying off very rapidly, and there's almost no seedlings to be found. Okay, so let's go over the pessimism here. Um, now, hopefully I've shown you that in situ conservation, with the problems of development, poaching, and climate change, is not enough. We also need ex situ conservation. It's not a separate activity and it shouldn't be underappreciated compared to in situ conservation. Ex situ conservation, especially for plants where there's fewer ethical issues involved and with animals, can be very quick 
and for plants, doesn't take up a lot of space. And in a lot of cases, it can be done without harming the natural population or what's left of it. Researchers and managers should facilitate ex situ efforts in any research project. Often it's not done at all. There's Monvalea estevesii, one of three cactus species that might be extinct. So that species was described by, if I remember correctly, Pierre Brown, named after Eddie Estevez. They kind of went back and forth when they were naming species. So there's like half a dozen species called Brownii and half a dozen species called Estevesii. Probably not the best thing to do, but that was back in the day. And so getting an export permit out of Brazil is really, really difficult, especially if you're not native. Even if you're a researcher, and I have a, there's a lab in my department on the campus that does a lot of Brazilian field work, they can't get export permits a lot of time, even for like dry leaves. Um, for cacti, it's nearly impossible. And some of the most threatened species are found in Brazil. So in the case of this species, no way to get an export permit when it was described. And so someone, most most likely one of the original describers or someone that was with them, did manage to smuggle a few seeds out of Brazil. Technically, that's poaching, right? Now, when that happens, and it does happen all the time, seeds are smuggled out of the country of origin. And in a lot of cases, the folks that do that, especially if they're serious uh, when it comes to conservation and research, they do want those plants to go to botanical gardens and so on. But botanical gardens will be like, oh, where do you get those? We can't touch that unless there's like proper permits. So in this case, the seed ended up in Malta in the Mediterranean. And the one person that had them threw them out in the greenhouse and wasn't, I don't know why he wasn't sharing them. Uh, but in the end, a hailstorm hit and destroyed the only known cultivated specimens of the species. And the habitat of the species, when you look at it on satellite map, well, the IUCN assessment is out of date. The IUCN assessment said might be extinct in a few years. The satellite map from the on, only known location right now is pure agricultural fields. Might be somewhere else, but the original population is 100% gone. <clears throat> Ex situ conservation is not just stuffing plants into your greenhouse, and it's not stuffing plants into a botanical garden either. This is Ripsalis triangularis. And so Ripsalis triangularis, when it was described also from Brazil, near uh, Rio de Janeiro, the cool lithophytic or epiphytic cacti, kind of grows in trees and so on. Um, so this species was described in the early 20th century was deposited into an herbarium somewhere in Brazil. And as happened uh, with a lot of species during World War II, um, when Germany was bombed, a lot of uh, specimens, very important specimens, were completely destroyed. If you've ever seen Jurassic Park 3, there's this big dinosaur with like a sail on its back, right? And so that one was discovered in Egypt and went to the Berlin Natural History Museum. And during World War II, the only known individual of that species, um, that fossil was completely destroyed. That was only like several decades later that they found it again. That's what might have happened to Ripsalis triangularis. For a while there, it looked like it might have been extinct in the wild. But luckily, recently it was found again, like a few plants in uh, a municipal garden in um, Rio de Janeiro. It's also in cultivation now. It's great. When you're doing any sort of ex situ conservation work, controlled propagation is key. Here's number two out of the three possibly extinct cacti. Discocactus subterraneo proliferans, another Brazilian plant, also described by the uh, same couple of researchers. And so uh, the type locality is gone. It's a village now. 
And plants may still exist in cultivation. It's not found, to my knowledge, at any botanical garden. Um, some private growers do have it, mostly in Europe. But it seems that they're mostly hybrids because people weren't pollinating them appropriately. And so some quotes here. I'm quite sure that this disco cactus is extinct in the wild and probably soon also in cultivation. And then one of the nurseries that does have it in Europe, uh, they said that I know this nursery and would not suggest a trust in these plants. Having seen the procedure of pollinating one brush or hundreds of plants uh, per day, they produce only hybrids. And the last quote is about some folks that have tried to go find it again in the wild, uh, um, actual experts, no trace. Propagation can also be collaborative. It doesn't just have to be botanical gardens. It can be locations like Pima Prickly Park. It doesn't have to be run by quote unquote scientists. We all need to have a say in the conservation process. We're all stakeholders. It's not just researchers, not just botanical gardens, not just academics, government officials, general public, cactus growers, industry. All of these groups should have a say in what happens. They're, these plants are all of our cultural heritage, not just for a select few. So we should all be able to enjoy them. And so collaborative ex situ conservation efforts can have great results. There's two critically endangered species of Pylosoceros from Brazil. In both cases, I believe the locations were very, very well hidden. Luckily, someone ended up finding them again and um, managed to get fruit properly exported, surprisingly. Um, and these are being grown um, in several places in the US now, including at my nursery. So a bunch of seeds were shipped over to me. And so the babies grew up, and a bunch of them have gone to the Huntington Botanical Gardens for their conservation program over there now. And so when botanical gardens and these institutions are willing to collaborate on these projects, we have a much greater chance of success than if it's just botanical gardens. Because when you look at some of these places, they're very, very short on staff, right? Very unfortunate. And I'm not blaming botanical gardens. I'm just blaming the general conservation problem. Not enough funding, not enough people, not enough time. And so to prove this, this is a paper that goes into how much can we expand the gene pool for some of these endangered plants when we don't just include plants from a single botanical garden, but also plants from different botanical gardens as a collaborative breeding project. And so it was found that treating the, the assets, quote unquote, the living collections of all these botanical gardens, when they're considered as one meta collection, we have much, much more genetic diversity. Now on top of that, well, that, that excluded private stakeholders. This is a succulent from Hawaii. Um, I think there's one individual left in the wild or it might be completely gone, separate male and female plants. Brighamia and Cygnus. It is a very, very common plant, especially in Europe, that's mass produced over there. You'll find it sometimes in the United States, not very often. And so there's a few distinct lineages from different wild plants before they went almost extinct in the wild, different botanical gardens. And so at one point, some commercial nursery in Europe that was mass producing them was like, oh, we've got that plant too. And so some researchers, uh, tested it, and that commercially grown plant, group of plants, represented an entirely separate genetic lineage that we thought was completely gone. It was there all along, produced in the thousands, tens of thousands. Considering all stakeholders can reduce poaching, because the plants are available, and therefore avoid extinction in the wild, can fund conservation, a lot of nurseries now, like the IUCN, for example, we have some private nurseries um, like Bee Below in Maryland that actually supports our work, our conservation efforts. 
So for that reason, we were able to repatriate some poached copiapoba back to Chile, where they're now in a uh, greenhouse in Antofagasta, I believe. And it could also help educate the public, right? So everyone should be included. So that includes native peoples, academics, botanical gardens, NGOs, industry, and also horticulturalists. So industry and horticulturalists, those are the folks that are most commonly excluded from the conservation process. And most of us probably grow some succulents and some cacti, right? Now, that's a strange issue, in my opinion, because when you look at CITES, and CITES is this big international agreement uh, regarding um, threatened species and how they should and shouldn't be traded internationally, the preamble to CITES actually explicitly recognizes the value of industry as well the economic purposes of some of these organisms. Now, I'm not saying that species should be commercialized. And I think mo most of you just want to enjoy them. But these stakeholders, industry and horticulturalists should not be excluded. That problem of excluding horticulturalists and amateur botanists I call that the ivory tower of cactology. And there's many more amateur botanists and horticulturalists out there with many, many more plants than all the botanical gardens in the world put together. And we have, and I kind of belong to both worlds, but the quote unquote amateur botanists they probably together have way more knowledge about these plants in the wild than uh, the experts do, the researchers, except for like in the case of a few species maybe. And most horticulturalists, most amateurs, quote unquote, care about conservation. So we're in it for the same purpose, right? We all want to enjoy these plants for one reason or another. So we need to break down that tower. Well, one of the ways we can do this is by developing new tools. This is Botanic Gardens Conservation International uh, Plant Search. And Plant Search is a database that botanical gardens can sign up for and share what they have in their collections. And then other members can request species or more information from other botanical gardens. Private growers are excluded from this. Okay. Fair enough. I know like there's probably quite a few people in here that have plants that are not found in any botanical garden worldwide and would be happy to share material. So we need to work on tools like that. But it's a two-way street. Requires efforts from both parties. When we're talking about taxonomy and plant naming, for example, you'll hear a lot of folks just grumbling and be like, oh, I don't want to change my labels and I'll oh, call it whatever you want. You know, I just think it's pretty, and that's fine. You know, enjoy your plants for whatever purpose you want. But then don't be surprised if you're not serious about keeping track about what you have, uh, is that, you know, collaboration with like a botanical garden or researcher is impossible. So the next issue of the National uh, Cactus and Succulent uh, Journal will have an article about keeping data uh, written by my friend Tristan and I. Uh, so take a look at that. Maintaining data? On where you got your plants from, what their names are, um, any sort of notes. It can help you notice patterns, be like, huh, my favorite plant last year, it flowered in May, and now it's flowering in June, and it's been progressively getting later and later in the year. Those types of information are actually very valuable. Now, if you have that information at home, great, but once, hopefully one day, we get the tools to all share that information together, or like platforms like uh, Plant Search that I just showed you, or iNaturalist, and then information will be very, very useful. If you care about taxonomy, once again, here's cactaceae at cariophilales.org. Um, definitely check that out if you're curious about the most recent names of the species. Another thing we can only do if we all work together is dealing with red tape. 
And I've mentioned a few examples here, like impossible to get permits to ship anything international or importing. So with the exit of the United Kingdom from the European Union, uh, they now came up with a system called the plant passport. And it is really darn hard to get any plants shipped internationally uh, for the UK now, really hard. For us in the US, it's also really difficult and the process is really intricate. And asking questions, well, USDA is very understaffed, let's put it that way. So figuring out these permits and so on, even though there's a free permit to import seed, cactus seed into the US, it's really difficult to figure out for folks. So lots of red tape, right? Here's some quotes. Um, they are so strict here when you import cacti, they actually seize it if you can't show phyto certificates, all for protecting wild cacti. But that same department allowed continuous destruction of our own local cacti for condominiums we don't need. The other one, I ordered Pylosicera seeds from the Netherlands that came with a plant passport, so their actual legal process. Customs seized it and destroyed it to fight illegal poaching. They don't know what the EU plant passport is, even though they're part of the EU, the country in question. Um, but it's okay to remove 80-year-old uh, columnars to build a boutique hotel on a hill and call it an eco-retreat. A lot of red tape, right? International trade has become so difficult and expensive, when done properly at least, that it affects private and commercial growers as well as conservation professionals. I've talked to individuals at multiple botanical gardens that have stopped any sort of international trade with other botanical gardens because they can't even get the permits themselves anymore. That stands in the way of conservation. Maybe the initial idea, stopping international poaching and trade, is a great one, but it doesn't work for plants. And so that's even resulted in problems for like private sellers. Like um, technically on Etsy, if you're familiar with that platform, you cannot sell any CITES species on Etsy at all, which technically means 99% of all cacti cannot be sold on, uh, on Etsy. eBay has started banning Trichoceras and all CITES 1 and 2 appendix species, even if they're grown uh, very clearly in cultivation. Like Ariocarpus, you can't mention that word on eBay anymore, all because they're so worried about all this international legislation that makes absolutely no sense. Another problem is plant nationalism. On the left-hand side is a list of species in Appendix 1 of CITES, highest classification, supposed to be some of the most poached and endangered species. And then in Appendix 2, you have the rest of cacti, so still a lot of protections. There's an exception for seeds. So seeds you should still be able to do without CITES permits, except, and this is the exception to the exception, if there are species from Mexico. And so it's the individual countries part of CITES that propose what species should be a part of CITES. And most of the time, it doesn't actually acknowledge the reality of conservation. A lot of Mexican species are not endangered at all, but they just wanna keep their species that only grow in Mexico, their species. So even researchers that do work in Mexico in some cases, good luck getting plants back even for an original description into the United States. Nationalism makes conservation more difficult and plants know no borders. Once again, here's all those poached plants from earlier. Building trust requires that both parties are invested. And we also need to redefine what poaching really means. To me personally, when I see someone digging up a plant out of the wild, that's poaching. That shouldn't be done unless you have a proper permit. And even in, in the case of having a proper permit, just because you have a permit doesn't make it right. Might make it legal, but not ethical. If you're a serious researcher and you go ahead and like cut a pad of an enormous prickly pear forest, then in my opinion, that's not poaching. If you're a serious researcher or you're intending to grow things for conservation, and you actually know what you're doing, then taking some fruit is not poaching in my opinion. 
but all of those activities are right now considered poaching. When it comes to seeds specifically, most cacti are not seed limited, which means most of those seeds are going to be eaten by herbivores anyway. And, you know, some of you might be the herbivores trying a little pink cushion cactus fruit, right? Pretty good. So we need to work on that too. So it's a prickly future. My take home messages are pretty much like, don't be slow. There's always going to be uncertainty about what, what we should be doing. But uh, if you don't make a decision, well, it'll very quickly be too late. Because the population typically decreases pretty gradually near the beginning. And then as you get smaller and smaller, that population gets smaller and smaller, all of a sudden it hits a threshold that's typically not known, and it collapses entirely. Often that's the case. So indecision, really bad. We need to give people tools to contribute. We need to get rid of that red tape I was talking about. We need to involve all stakeholders. We need to provide leadership as well. Again, we have an organization like the Tucson Cactus and Succulent Society actually taking action beyond just talking, like a lot of these societies do, unfortunately. Things we can do, we can educate, build online resources on conservation projects and legislation. We can enforce ethics guidelines. We can support research. We can collaborate, build partnerships with other organizations and individuals. We can lobby for change, lobby for common sense, simple trade legislation. We can only do that when all of us that want the same final result, cacti doing well in the wild, if we all work together. This is a quick plug here for the Cactus and Succulent Society of America Conservation Initiative. Well, I'm on the conservation board. Um, and so there's now a conservation program as well that provides funding for conservation projects. Um, and we're actively working on a bunch of uh, different initiatives that hopefully actually support conservation as well. So a bunch of people I want to thank, particularly the Tucson Club, just in general. You, you all have been great. I wouldn't be where I was today if it weren't from the support of some of uh, the members here. I moved to Tucson in 2016, and our, some of the people that I first met in the cactus community uh, are here today, and I'm, I want to say thank you for that. Um, giving a couple other talks later this summer uh, for the Maricopa County Master Naturalists in August, and then at the Huntington Botanical Garden at the Succulent Symposium in September. And I can answer any questions. I'm interested to know whether you are using the Biosphere 2 for any of your research or conservation work. And if not, why isn't that being broadcast through the Biosphere 2, which unfortunately just seems like it is not giving any, any good information for other than just look, looky see kind of, you know, look at these neat buildings. The other question that I have is, um, in trying to duplicate conditions such as the Brazilian dikea, what kind of reference or website would you recommend so that we can get much more specific about soil science, um, humidity levels, seasonal changes, and the potential for um, climate change that these plants can withstand. I live in Oracle. Ugh. And so I'm constantly dealing with, well, I can't have any of those plants because I will freeze them to death. But um, I'm thinking that with climate change, some of that may <laughs> become more possible for me to grow, right. sadly. Thank you. So uh, first part, unfortunately, I have to agree with what you're saying. Um, some people in my department not focused on cacti, they do do some research at Biosphere. Um, I'm not terribly familiar with Biosphere. I've only gone a few times. Uh, but yeah, it's a very pretty place. And that's pretty much it. Don't tell anyone. Um, at least when it comes to cacti and succulents. And I've never spoken to anyone over there in charge, able to make decisions. Um, but I... 
doubt that there's much of an avenue for conducting research or conservation work there. But you also have to think about these organizations. They have to, they need funding, right? So and most of that funding is gonna come from people wanting to visit, people wanting to just look at pretty plants and pretty buildings and so on. And I'm not, I'm talking about all of these organizations, zoos, botanical gardens, things, places like biosphere. So that's where the money has to come from. That's the unfortunate reality. That's part one. Part two, uh, where can we learn more about some of the things that these plants require and the potential impacts of climate change? Right now, there's pretty much no platform where you can get all that information in a centralized way. So what the IUCN is hoping to do, and we're working on a draft document right now, is to actually include the climate change projections and the maps as part of the assessments. If you look up IUCN Red List, you'll find all these conservation assessments. Most of the time, there, there might be a map associated with them, but not a lot of information about climate change and soils and so on. So it's easy to do. If you have these occurrence points, like the ones I work with in my research, or even things like iNaturalist, it probably require an organization like iNaturalist, a few weeks of maybe one or two people working on it from an IT perspective to show you right on the spot what the average climate conditions are in that area and are, if there are climate projections for those species to also show those at the same time. We have information about soils at a resolution of uh, a quarter of a kilometer. Climate, very high resolution data out there as well. I'm hoping to do something like that with my website. I already like for each species for, uh, and I'm talking about my nursery, uh, where for each species I list the conservation status. I'm hoping to eventually also include maps um, of where the species has been observed when it's okay to show. So like not for threatened species and what the average climate is there, what the soil conditions are there. Personally, I'm not very good at it. Um, and I treat all my cacti and succulents, regardless of where they're from, pretty much the same way. Same soil for seedlings and adult plants, same watering regime, typically same amount of sunlight. And a lot of these plants can handle, especially in cultivation, much, much of a wider set of conditions than the experience in the wild. And a big outstanding question with cacti and succulents is, do they live where they live in the wild because they like it there or only because they're the only ones that can handle it? So we don't really know. Um, so a lot of them can handle it. Like some of these Galapagos prickly pears, it's somewhat cold there at night in some areas, but um, a lot of them can withstand frost and they don't really, with, uh, don't really experience frost in the wild. Um, lots of mysteries, but uh, it's a great set of questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I was just uh, curious. Uh, you mentioned, you know, the, with the uh, Corypanther robustus fina being transplanted there, about 30% mortality. Of course, the flip side of that is 70% survival, at least in the short term. Yep. Um, so, you know, assisted migration, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, obviously, it's resource intensive. You can't do it for hundreds of thousands of plant species, but uh, yeah, for the saguaro, which has a very long generation time, you know, might that not be something that would be worthwhile, at least for selected species? I think assisted migration for succulents has more of a, is more of a prospect when you're actually um, dispersing the seeds rather than adult plants or even planting seedlings. Uh, most of the research I'm familiar with, and there's not a lot for transplanting cacti, so assisted migration, or just translocation for rescue projects, most adult cacti do not take very well to it at all. When we're looking at Copiapoa, the ones with the biggest poaching problem, those plants that were confiscated and were sent back to Chile, they're never going to be able to go back in the ground. So part of the problem is biological, but also from a conservation perspective, we don't just want to protect species. We also want to protect the ecosystem that they live in. And then more recently, we're also protecting the genetics. So it's conservation at three different levels of biological diversity. And so we want genetic diversity as well, because genetic diversity is the raw material that will allow these plants to change in the future when we might not be around anymore either as human beings. And so with assisted migration, one big problem is, is that if you move plants from a certain population to an area that has another population nearby, several hundred miles away, the genetics may be completely different. 
And so you could be, call, uh, you could be causing something called outbreeding, um, where the offspring are actually very poorly fit to the environment. There's other issues as well, like taxonomy. Sometimes you have a group of plants that looks like one species. Later, we discover it's actually two species. And in the case of assisted migration, you might end up creating accidental hybrids where there were none before. But again, we're never going to have all of the information. So, and especially genetics, still very, very expensive to look at. So in some of these cases, if we know uh, that these plants have a good chance of success, we need to go ahead and actually do it instead of just talking about it. So that's, I hope that answered the question. That's a great one. Quick question online. Uh, Thomas asked if that you referenced the peanut pineapple cactus and the su success rates with three plants. Uh, he wanted a specific paper or mm -hmm. uh, source that he could get that yep. information from. Uh, so definitely sent me an email for the full citation, but the uh, thesis is Berthelet 2017. Any other questions? Let me make a, a comment or two, because I've been involved with this issue for the last 70-some uh, years. Um, one of the reasons why we got into the rescue program in TCSS is because we saw the need. We, we saw the need that, you know, there's going to be development. You can't stop it. And so what can you do to make it a little bit more pleasant? Uh, and Steve and other folks have been telling me now that it's more difficult as we do rescues because the developers see the value in all these plants and they're saving them for repopulating the grounds. Uh, instead of putting in water thirsty plants, they're replanting the saguaros and acatillos and barrels and, and other plants. Uh, so essentially, you know, we've done a pretty good job. Things have changed dramatically in the last 25 years. Um, I'll give you a for instance. Um, um, we had a, a congressperson who was very interested in working with all of us about changing some of the CITES rec uh, regulations about importing uh, plants from Mexico because of the horticultural industry. Uh, was suffering. We had somebody who was supporting us who, was, who would go to Congress. Unfortunately, she was shot and uh, uh, never got a chance to really help us. And, and Gabby was a great friend. She was at the um, 2009 uh, convention and, and uh, opened it up for the Tucson Cactus Society. Um, she was a great friend of ours. And uh, unfortunately, uh, she couldn't finish the job that she was interested in starting. Uh, we had a program a number of years ago where if you had an interesting plant coming into bloom, you would put it on our website. So if somebody else had a plant, we could exchange pollen uh, and uh, and seeds. So it was almost like a like a dating game for uh, cacti plants. Um, I I actually I did this with uh, with Jean Joseph on a on a yucca in Lickiana. Uh, and so I, I was able to pollinate my uh, flowers. I got seeds. Uh, Gene took the seeds, and I think I gave him like 100 seeds, and he only got 99 to germinate. Uh, that's the kind of stuff we can do in this club. Uh, uh, I was out today uh, collecting swirl fruit at Prickly Park uh, so that uh, I could have the seeds. I have about, uh, right now I have five or six ounces of saguaro seeds, which might be 50 or 100,000 seeds. But we're, we've been talking about a, a saguaro project. Um, you know, our philosophy is, my philosophy is, I want my grandchildren's grandchildren to be able to see a large multi-armed uh, saguaro in bloom. And so we need to start these things now. We can't wait. Uh, it took... Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't want to say anything negative, but it took a long time for CSSA, the Cactus and Sucking Society of America, to embrace our rescue program. At first, they were very opposed to it because they thought it would encourage uh, more poaching. Uh, instead of seeing the, the positives and how 130,000 plants later that we've saved, and most of them have done well in, in, uh, 
and being transplanted. And we're learning a great deal and we're passing that on to all of our members on how to transplant these plants. So there's some real value uh, in what we've done. And, and what Michael is, is talking about is so important that, that we, you know, we can't just talk about it. We have to start doing it. And so you all need to get involved. Unfortunately, uh, there's been a lot of great collectors and growers 30, 40, 50 years ago before CITES that were going down to Mexico and South America and bringing back all these plants in their collection. And instead of trying to uh, get these plants and, and get the fruit and, and propagate them, we're losing all these collections. Most of those kinds of people, they're all dead now. Uh, you know, they're 10, 15, 20 years older than me and we've lost their collection. And that's that's unfortunate thing. We have to stop doing that. We have to take advantage of what's out there. And we need we need all of you to let us know what you have so that we can help preserve these plants. I didn't mean to take up your space. Michael, this was great. Thank you so much. Mark.